we've got left and right, not registering anything, forwards and backwards, up and down. All right, let's give a high five a shot. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's awesome. I can't believe that worked. In the first video in this series, I talked about how we can use deep learning to recognize complex patterns in data. And I sort of jokingly stated that one example could be to recognize and count high fives using an accelerometer. Well, it turns out it wasn't so much of a joke because this is me testing it out on a network that I just trained. And it's working surprisingly well. So in this video, I wanna talk about how this was accomplished the data pre-processing I did, and why transfer learning made it possible for me to solve this problem in just a couple of hours. So I hope you stick around for it. I'm Brian, and welcome to a MATLAB Tech Talk. For this project, I'm using a simple MEMS accelerometer that's wired to an Arduino. The Arduino reads the sensor and prints the measurements onto a serial bus, which is then connected to my computer via USB and I'm reading the serial bus with MATLAB and plotting the last second and a half of data onto the screen. And you can see as I move the accelerometer around how it changes the plot accordingly. Now, this is just sort of random motions, but what I really want is something that can recognize a very specific sequence of accelerations, the high five. Now, of course, this was kind of a simple high five motion since the cables I'm using are quite short, but this is going to be the motion that I'm going to teach a deep neural network to learn. And you're just gonna to have to use your imagination that this is a full scale high five in all of its glory. Okay, so this is the acceleration pattern that I'm looking for. And the general approach I'm taking to solve this problem is to turn this three dimensional signal into images that I can use to train a deep neural network. And this is similar to what we did in the last video where we pre-processed audio signals with the short time Fourier transform, and we used it to create a spectrogram. And I could do that here as well, and it would probably work just fine. But what I'm gonna do instead is use the continuous wavelet transform to create a scalagram. A scalogram is another time frequency representation of signals, but it differs from the spectrogram in a way that makes it more suitable for signals that exist at multiple scales. That is, signals that are low frequency and slowly varying, but then are occasionally interrupted with high frequency transients. They're useful for signals like ECGs that have this characteristic heartbeat pattern. And as it turns out, they're useful for the occasional high five in an otherwise slowly moving hand. Now, I'm not gonna go into the details of the scalogram in this video, since there's a whole bunch of other things that I wanna cover, but I left several great resources in the description that you should check out if you want to learn more. All right, so the first thing I wanna point out is that we need three images to represent a high five. And therefore, I have to feed three images into my network architecture. But luckily, many architectures are already set up to input color images, which have a red, blue, and green channel. So to just fit with those existing architectures, what I did was assign the X scalogram to the red channel, Y to the green, and Z to the blue, and then combine them to create a single color image. And this sort of pinkish volcano with some smoke coming off of its peak is the scalogram representation of a high five. And this image looks pretty cool, right? But I think it gets even cooler if we view the scalogram on the real-time acceleration stream. Each sample time I receive a new measurement from the sensor, I then update the buffer of the last few seconds of data, and I create the scalogram. You can see how the patterns and colors change as I move the sensor around. And what's really cool is that you probably couldn't tell if I was doing a high five by looking at the raw acceleration data streaming by, but I'm sure you can see the characteristic pink volcano streaking past every once in a while. It's a very obvious pattern. And we can now take this process data and train a deep neural network to find that obvious pattern. But in order to do that, there are at least two things that I need still. I need some training data with labeled scalograms of high fives and some with no high fives, and I need an architecture. Let's talk about the architecture first. 
Rather than design and train an architecture completely from scratch, we can build on what already exists with transfer learning. Transfer learning is modifying an existing architecture and then retraining it to accomplish your task rather than the task it was originally trained for. And to understand what that means, let's revisit what we talked about in the first video with the very basic description of what these image-based architectures are doing. They are looking for patterns in images. And it does that by looking for primitive features in the early layers, like blobs and edges and colors. And then as you progress through the layers, it combines them into more complex features, and then ultimately combines those into final patterns that can be labeled. Again, this is an oversimplification of these networks, but this is a useful oversimplification for describing transfer learning. Let's assume that this is a network that's fully trained to recognize flowers in images. Now, obviously a network trained to recognize flowers won't do a great job of classifying high five patterns in our scalograms. But here is the interesting thing. Blobs and color and loops and lines and features like that exist in pretty much all images, including our scalograms. It's only the last few layers in the network that combine those features and does the final classification that is very specific to the type of images you want to classify. So we can think of this first portion of a trained image classification network as a general feature recognizer. And therefore, we can keep them and then chop off the last few layers responsible for the specific classification and replace those with new layers that can output the labels that we are looking to classify. Now, theoretically, training this network should be much faster and require much less training data since there is a lot less that the network has to learn. It doesn't need to learn how to recognize the primitive features. It only needs to learn how to combine them to recognize the larger patterns you are looking for. Which is great because most image networks require millions of training images and weeks of time using several high-end GPUs to train. And I don't have that kind of time or the hardware or the arm strength to create millions of high five training images and then train a giant network. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start with an existing network and then modify the last few layers and then retrain it with a much smaller amount of training data. So ready? Let's get to it. There are many different pre-trained image classification networks that I can start from, and they each have their own execution speeds, database sizes, and prediction accuracies. And I'm going to go with GoogleNet for this project, but I assure you this choice didn't come down to any logical reasoning. It's just because the MATLAB example that I'm basing my project off of uses GoogleNet and transfer learning to recognize patterns in ECG signals. So to keep it in line with this example, I'm going to do the same. All right, the first thing I want to do is load Google Net into MATLAB and just try to give you a sense of how massive this network is. We can open it up in the Deep Network Designer app to visually see all of the layers and how they are connected. And check out this architecture. It has 144 layers. And there's a bunch of different things going on in this architecture. There's some convolutional layers at the beginning, followed by a series of parallel inception layers. And there's a number of these groupings, just one after another. Now, luckily, we don't really need to concern ourselves with most of these layers for our transfer learning example. The important ones are at the end. This layer here is a fully connected layer, which means that each input of which there are 1,024, connect to each of the outputs, of which there are 1,000. So simplistically, the way we can think about this is that there are 1,024 different complex features that this network has learned, and it uses combinations of those features to classify 1,000 different objects. So whichever output value from this layer is the largest, it assigns the label that is associated with that particular neuron and it finds the maximum values with this probability layer, and then determines the label with this output layer. You can see the labels here. They're Tench and Goldfish and Great White Shark and 997 others. So for this project, we only need to replace two layers, the fully connected layer and the output layer. And I can drag in a new fully connected layer into our network, and then by clicking on it, I can change its parameters. 
I want to set the output size to be two, which essentially means that we want this layer to combine the 1024 input features to recognize just two main patterns. And since this layer hasn't been trained at all, I'm going to increase the weight and bias learning rate factor to five. This will allow this layer to make larger changes with each training cycle. Now, the second layer we need to replace is this final output layer, so that it only has two labels, high five and not high five. And it's going to determine what those labels are automatically from the training data, so we don't have to specify them here. And that's it. We're going to use the rest of the network as is. Now, we're almost ready to start training, but first we need to create our training data. The ECG example used about 160 images for training and validation. So to stay in line with that order of magnitude, I opted to record 100 high five images and 100 non high five images. I created a script that loops 100 times, recording one and a half seconds of acceleration data each loop, and then saving off the scalagram in a data folder. And I got pretty good at timing my high fives so that the event happened near the middle of the window but I did have to go through the full list of images and prune out the ones that didn't look so good. I didn't want those bad images to corrupt the training. But overall, you can clearly see that the pink volcano appears in all of these and about in the center of the image. And I did the same thing for the other label, no high five. Here I just recorded various things like no motion or slight random motion or other faster motions that are similar to but not quite a high five. And that's it. With my training data created, I can start the training. Let's go back to the Deep Network Designer app in MATLAB. Under the data tab, we can import all of the training data that was just created. And all of my data exists within the data folder and the high five and no high five subfolders. And the names of the subfolders is where it's pulling the labels from. And if I wanted to, I could also augment all of this data by scaling, translating, or rotating it in order to cover all of the possible solution conditions, but I'm just going to leave it as is. And lastly, I'm going to have it randomly select 20% of the data to be used for validation. So this is a snapshot of my training data. We have 80 examples of high fives and 80 examples of no high fives. And on the training tab, I can now set my training options. Here I'm making a few adjustments to how I want to train this network, but I'm just changing them to match the training parameters that were in the MATLAB example that I showed you earlier. And the link to that example is in the description of this video if you want to check it out. It goes over all of this stuff in really good detail. All right, so with the options set, we can start training this network. So let's kick it off. And while we wait for this to train, let's talk about the steps we took to get here. We took a network that was trained to recognize objects like goldfish and sharks and repurposed it to find patterns in three-dimensional acceleration data. And while I used it to create something rather silly, this process can be used to find patterns in any data. GoogleNet in particular requires a color image as input. And so as long as you can format that data into an image, you could use this transfer learning process. You could use it for object detection like pedestrians or street signs. You could use it for predictive maintenance to find patterns in data that indicate when the component will fail. You could use this to look for defects in materials. You could use it to find patterns in data from wearable electronics, like determining if a person is walking or running, or if their head was impacted too hard. There's a million use cases for this. There's also networks that are pre-trained to classify sounds, like the VGG-ish network. And we can use transfer learning with it as well to get it to classify our own sounds in audio signals. And what's really interesting about this whole thing is how quickly you can get a trained network up and running. I started this project by following along with an existing MATLAB example, but I essentially went from nothing to a trained network in about two hours. And this was with a single CPU. Now, your project might require more training data than I used, and maybe a GPU for training in a reasonable amount of time, but starting from an existing network will almost certainly require less time and data than having to start from scratch. And starting from an existing MATLAB example, of which there are a lot, you can jump into these types of problems much quicker.
And I left a link to this example list in the description. All right, so we got ourselves a trained network now, and it took about four minutes to train. Also, the network is 97% accurate using at least the 20% of the data that we set aside for validation. So it missed one of the 40 images. Not too bad. And now, this brings us back to the initial video I showed you of me testing out the train network on the acceleration data stream. Each sample time, I would update the scalagram based on the latest acceleration data and then feed that image into the classify function and have it return a label. If the label came back as a high five, I displayed that and incremented my high five counter. And that's pretty much the whole thing. It turned out to be easier than I was expecting and the whole high five counter is actually pretty satisfying to run. So I hope this has helped you understand the benefits of transfer learning and maybe got you thinking about your own particular pattern recognition problems and whether a technique like this could help you with classification. This is where I'm going to leave this video, but in the next video I want to talk about verification of these trained networks and how we can be confident that they're going to work. So if you don't want to miss that or any other Tech Talk video, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Also, if you want to check out my channel, Control System Lectures, I cover more control theory topics there as well. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.